All right. So welcome to our first wild food cooking demo. Um, we're excited to be here. We're going to introduce ourselves first. Um, we appreciate you joining us. I know it's a little bit of a crazy time. Let me grab my um, It's a little bit of a crazy time. Um, so we appreciate you tuning in for uh, this first demo, and we're going to see how it goes. So please feel free to uh, give your feedback in the comments, provided that it's nice feedback. Um, and um, we're going to jump in here. So my name's Shane Rogers, and I work for the Vermont Farm to Plate Network. And um, here at the Vermont Farm to Plate Network, uh, we have a project called Rooted in Vermont. And one of the things that we're really trying to do is celebrate how all folks are doing local food in their own unique ways. Um, and one of those ways is obviously wild food. Um, so today and tonight, what we're going to be doing for you um, is we have Corey Hart from Vermont Fish and Wildlife, and we're going to be doing a demo of not only how to process trout and cook it up pretty easily, but some farm fresh sides that we can find um, popping up in the farm stands now, along with some cool wild edibles that are starting to pop up. Corey, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, my name is Corey Hart. I'm an education specialist with Fish and Wildlife. My main role with the department is to do uh, mainly most of our aquatic education by overseeing our Let's Go Fishing program, which is a series of volunteer instructors that we have. Uh, for today, though, we wanted to focus on trout because tomorrow is the trout opener in Vermont. So April 11th is going to be our trout opening day. And while we do still have a stay-at-home order that's going on right now, it's still encouraged for Vermont residents to get out and actually go fishing within 10 miles of your house. It's a great, great way to get out, go get some exercise and get away from people all at the same time. And on that note, all of our normal stocking activities for the year have continued uh, as planned. So stocking trucks are still running, everything's been stocked. Uh, the only thing that changed this year is because of the crowds, uh, we weren't advertising in real time for when we were stocking locations because we didn't want groups of people to show up. So typically if a location that you fish is, has been stocked in the past, chances are it has been. It might just not be up on our website yet because we're holding off on some of those postings. Uh, but for today, we're focusing on brook trout. Uh, so a variety of brook trout that we picked up. So these ones actually came from our Salisbury hatchery. And for those that aren't aware, we have five hatcheries in Vermont. Uh, we have Salisbury one, uh, Grand Isle, uh, Roxbury, Bennington, and Bald Hill. Awesome. So before we dive in um, to the brook trout processing, uh, we are going to explore some easy to make sides that you should be able to find in your pantry. Um, one of the big things that is happening right now um, is that obviously with everything being disrupted, we're really seeing our farmers step up in huge ways to support their community. Um, I have personally been inspired by just how much they are stepping up to really make sure that our communities are staying fed. So one of the things that um, goes great with this brook trout is we're gonna do some cast iron, um, do a cast iron skillet um, with some potatoes. And then in addition to that, um, we are going to add some wild leeks and uh, which you might know as ramps and we're going to add some garlic. So um, for this cast iron skillet, um, I turned this on about two minutes ago, um, and the cast iron is definitely one of my favorite things to cook in. Um, we keep it on our stove nonstop um, and keep it well oiled. And if you all haven't really checked out cast irons, I would highly suggest that you can find them at rummage sales and you can find them all over the place. And they just take a little bit of elbow grease to get them up and running. Uh, so for these potatoes, these are like a staple in our house. Um, and these potatoes came from uh, City Market from one of our local farmers. Um, and you can also pick up potatoes almost at any farm stand around the state right now. Um, and our farmers are doing a lot to make sure that folks are staying fed and making sure that um, people have access to it. One of the things that um, 
has been awesome to see is all these farm stands being stopped. And what we're doing is making sure that what the farmers are doing are making sure that all the protocols are being followed and making sure that you can pick up your food. You can order a lot of it online and you can go in also while following social distance. So for these potatoes, um, this is like I said, a staple in our house whenever we're just looking to try and make sure that uh, we want something hearty to eat on our sides. Um, so we just throw the cast iron on, throw a little bit of oil into the pan to get that nice and hot. And what I like to do is I like to cut my potatoes nice and small because I like them really crispy. Now, for those who may not, uh, may like bigger potatoes, you can always turn your oven on. And one of the biggest, best parts about the cast iron is that after you fry it up a little bit, you can just pop it in the oven and let them finish off so you can make sure that you have um, those nice fluffy potatoes that you like. So um, as you can see, I got my potatoes cut and they're just gonna go right into here. I don't know. And I'm gonna throw a couple potatoes around. Obviously, this is my tryout for being on uh, the Food Network. So if you guys have feedback or comments or questions, uh, you know, definitely let us know because um, it's only up from here, as I can imagine. Um, so one of the things that we like to make sure we throw in is we always throw in some onions usually with that. But with the springtime popping and all of a sudden all this green popping up, what you're going to be able to find is um, some wild edibles that are popping up. Now, the important thing to remember about these wild edibles that you're finding is make sure, A, that you know 100% what you are eating. Do not ever go out and pick something and end up eating it if you're not 100% sure, because that is going to lead to either you having a really bad night or it can even lead to worse things, um, such as you getting really, really sick. Um, so for, um, for this demonstration, I have a uh, friend who has a spot with a huge ramp pack. And the reason that I say this is because ramps take such a long time to grow that if you are going to be able to go out and buy them, you need to make sure that you're harvesting them sustainably. Now, sustainably to me means picking only the bare minimum of what you need and leaving the majority of this huge patch that you have that you have that you're going to go back to. Ramps traditionally take like five to seven years to grow to maturity and to be able to um, continue growing. So um, really the best, the best thing to do is if you find a patch that doesn't have a lot of ramps is to leave it be. That is like the biggest thing because if you end up starting to harvest all of them, then there's gonna be no more left and they can be an important part of the ecosystem as well. So for the ramps, all I'm doing is just giving them a rough chop here. Um, and as they grow bigger, um, what you can do is you can just harvest, which is um, probably the best, is just harvest the leaves of the ramps. And the leaves just have this awesome, awesome taste to it. And um, one of the ways that you can make sure that you identify a ramp properly, um, and again, this is all coming from an amateur forager and an amateur cook, um, is they smell incredibly like onions when you cook them up. But again, if you're going out to harvest wild edibles, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you know exactly what you're putting into your body and you wanna make sure that you're doing it sustainably again. And for that, I can't stress enough. So the last thing that we add pretty easily is just to smash up some garlic here. Um, and garlic, obviously you can find everywhere. And one of the best parts about this is that with all of the food starting to come back online, with the weather starting to change, is that there are literally farm stands and farmer's markets that happen everywhere around Vermont. So as you're looking to make sure that you're feeding your family the food that you want to be feeding them, um, make sure you consider you know, helping to support the, the communities that you're in and also Vermont agriculture. So one of those resources that you can find online is the Northeast Organic Farming Association does a really nice job at having listings of farm stands and farmers markets that are available around the state. 
Um, and later on, um, once we get Corey, I'll start dropping in resources about ways that you can find uh, farmers markets and um, farm stands that are going on around the state. And another uh, excellent way to not only support local agriculture, but to make sure that you're getting the farm fresh food that you want and that pairs so well with wild edibles is consider doing a community supported agriculture trip. And for those who don't necessarily know what a CSA is, basically you pay up front for the food that you're going to get the rest of the season. And it's an excellent way to guarantee that week in and week out, you're going to be supplied with the freshest vegetables and arguably the best tasting vegetables. Um, and again, NOFA has a great resource where you can go and you can see CSAs um, that are available. And all the farms generally have an online presence where you can go and check in and see what works for you and your family. So as I get those going, um, potatoes will take probably like about 20 minutes to 30 minutes, depending on how big you cut them, how hot your heat is. Um, so depending on everything else that you're going to be doing, you may want to make sure that you get those going early. Um, and another way to do this, which is much easier, but not as demonstrative, is that you could just throw this all on a sheet pan covered in an oil and sprinkle some salt and pepper on them and make sure um, and just pop them in the oven until they're nice to the taste that you want. Um, so as these get going, um, another great side to go with your um, hopefully freshly cut trout that you're going to be going out starting April 11th um, is just a nice green salad. And what I have here are some sprouts that my uh, friend actually grew in his basement, um, which is great. Um, I don't know what else he's growing down there, but I don't ask questions. Um, and what I did is I shredded up some carrots and really it goes well with any root vegetables. And one of the best um, dressings that we've that I've ever discovered comes from uh, the Vermont Harvest of the Month recipe for maple balsamic, right? Because it combines all the best things that we want. You get your fresh greens, and then you also get to add in some of that sweet Vermont maple that you know is just sitting in the back of your fridge and ready to be used whenever. Um, so this is a fairly simple recipe. Um, really, I generally use olive oil, but since everything happened, uh, we're using sunflower oil because all the olive oil was uh, bought up. So if you have a ton of olive oil, go ahead and make sure that uh, you're using that. And you're gonna do about a half a cup of oil. Um, I like, you could do it in your traditional measuring cup. And this is also like a great way to involve your kids in the process, especially if you're teaching them or want to get them into the kitchen to feel familiar. You're going to use the measuring cups. You get to go through all the different bottles. Um, so after you get that half cup of oil in your pan, you're going to do two tablespoons of maple syrup. And if you want it to be a little bit sweeter, go ahead. I know that us in Vermont really like our maple syrup. So there is no, uh, there's no judgment if you're going to add more maple syrup to your dressing. Um, and you're going to do that with two tablespoons of balsamic dressing. The best part about making your own dressing is that, to me, there's so many different variations that you can make of this. Really, all you need is an oil and your favorite vinegar and something sweet to add into it. Add some seasoning and something to emulsify it, and you're good to go. We like to do things with tahini. We like to do things with apple cider vinegar. I mean, anything and everything. Now, the uh, next important part is to make sure that you add a little bit of an emulsifier in there. So Dijon mustard works really, really well. And all you really need is just like a drip of it in there. And what that's going to do is that's going to bring together your oil and your vinegar um, so you don't have any separation. In there. Now, of course, if you don't have it, it's not the biggest deal in the world. You can just shake it up um, and make sure that uh, you keep shaking it before um, every time. So once you have all that ready, the easiest way to do this and another fun thing that you can do with your kids, um, and it goes well with just about any greens that you're going to be picking up from the farmer's market, um, is 
dump all of that into a nice little mason jar. And you're gonna pop a lid on that. And then from that lid, you just shake and shake and shake. So if you're trying to cook dinner <laughs> and your kids are running around, or if you're trying to cook dinner and your partner is just bothering you, this is a great way to give them something to do to occupy your hands. So you could get back to cooking those potatoes and also um, starting to get ready to process your trout. So from that, I'm gonna throw it over to Corey and Corey is gonna show you all how to get in and process the trout. And then we'll bump it back for a nice dessert option. Awesome. Uh, before we get right into the trout, I see on um, somebody had a question about where we could find uh, a list of farm stands that are open right now. Do you have any information on that? Yeah, so a list of farm stands that are open right now, um, the best way to find that is you can look at the NOFA website. Uh, they have lists of farm stands that are open. Um, you could do a quick search. Also, the Atlas on the Vermont Farm to Plate Network website is a great way to find farm stands at different farms that are in your area. And what we'll do here um, as Corey gets going is I'll drop some of those resources into the chat. Um, and you should be able to uh, just click on them and explore to your heart's content. Um, again, I would highly recommend uh, keeping on supporting our farmers because our farmers have done so much to support us, especially during this time. Go ahead, Corey. So we'll get started with the fish processing side of things, and then we'll move right on into cooking. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier today, we're going to be focusing on brook trout. So these are some trout that came out of our Salisbury hatchery. And again, we're focusing on trout right now because tomorrow, April 11th, is trout opener in Vermont. And if you're going out fishing, uh, we encourage you to still stay within, uh, within about 10 miles of home uh, per the governor's stay-at-home order that we currently have. Uh, but uh, when you're find, trying to locate an area to go fishing this time of year, your best options is going to be fishing uh, an area that low elevation. Remember, we just had ice out not too long ago, and then a slow-moving body of water as well. Uh, so like a low elevation, slow moving river would be a really good option. Just going with something as simple as using a worm. Or uh, if you're going to be out on a lake, uh, trolling a Rapala or something like that behind your boat or casting a Rapala from shore would be the trick as well, right under the surface. Uh, but we'll get right into it. Uh, frequently we hear when we're talking about fish processing, it's something that usually people uh, shy away from and it seems really, really complicated. Uh, it's very, very simple to do. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we'll go over a few parts of the fish real quick. Uh, that'll make it a little bit easier for you as we get started. Uh, so again, this is our brook trout. Uh, you have your pe pectoral fins right here. I'll try to bring that to the camera so you can see what I'm looking at. Your pelvic fins here, and this one you can see is actually the clip, so we'll flip over to the other side. So that's your pelvic fin. And then down in the rear, that's gonna be our anal fin. You have the anal vent. Uh, right next to it. The way we're going to cook this up tonight is we're just going to do trout in a hot skillet with garlic salt, onion salt, butter. Uh, it's really nothing uh, more simple than that. So to clean this fish, all I'm going to do, I'm going to take a small knife, so it's just a small four inch fillet knife, and I'm going to make an incision uh, right at that anal vent. And from my cut in, I'm going to cut all the way up, right up to its gills. And this is where you can make the decision uh, if you want to leave the head on or take it off. With these smaller trout, typically I'm going to cut the head off and cook it that way. Uh, keep in mind, if you're cut, cutting it up in the field, uh, so if I was cutting this up out on the water or somewhere like that, you need to leave the head on when you're in the field because, if remember, you have to follow all the regulations, all that stuff out there. Uh, if there's a size limit on the fish you're catching, there's no way for us to measure it if you cut the head off. Uh, so keep the head on until you get home if you're doing that, if you're cutting it up somewhere else. Uh, but again, all you're going to do, slice in at the anal vent, and very carefully, just right under the skin, bring it all the way up to those gills. And you'll see, I can take it and peel it, and you'll see all the guts in there. Because I'm not keeping the head, the next part's actually really easy. So. And I can't tell if you can see the cutting board or not because it's got the, the way the name is right there. Uh, but I'm just going to make a decision right behind the pectoral fin and cut, cut the head off right behind the scales. 
flip it over a second time if you need to, and cut from the other side. So your head is off. I know it looks kind of gross. You got the guts and everything. What I'm going to do now is you can use your thumb or you can use a spoon. I usually just use my thumb and you'll just take the guts, everything, scoop it right out. And you see now the guts are out. They still got a little bit more in there that's not meat. So what I'm going to do is just take my thumb and just rig all of that out. And now this trout is clean, it's ready to go. The only extra step I might do is some people prefer to tech, uh, cut off uh, the pelvic fins, uh, which would be right here. With these smaller trout, it's usually more of a hassle, honestly, I feel, uh, to cut it off. And I just would deal with it when I'm eating the fish. Uh, but you don't take the skin off for this style, we leave the skin right on. And when I cook it, it's actually gonna crisp up quite nicely. But I'm going to do one more trout just to show you. And at the end, if I need to show you again, I have more trout for that. So again, all I'm doing, slice right at the anal vent, put your knife right under the skin, slice right up. Remember, I'm not going in very far at all. I'm just going right in under the skin. Then I make a cut, cut the head off. And you can, you can cook it with the head on if you want. You don't want to take out the gills. Uh, but usually most people aren't going to cook with a head on unless, until you get some of the larger size fish. With these smaller ones, uh, there's really no point in leaving the head on. So again, pick up the, the guts. You still got a little bit in there, so now it would be you take your thumb, Break everything right out. That one's clean, it's ready to go. The only next thing I would need to do with these two before I put them in the pan is I'm gonna to wanna to go over to the sink and just rinse them out real quick. There's a quick rinse with cold water, not very long, and then you're ready to put them in the pan. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is take off, take off my gloves. Uh, but behind me, I've got my, got my pan. I'm going to heat that up, get some butter in it. Uh, we're going to turn back over to shade for a second so I can rinse off these fish. And then I'm going to come right back and throw the fish in the pan for you. Awesome. Thank you, Corey. Um, and if folks who are um, tuning in have any questions um, or any suggestions, just let us know and we're happy to answer um, any. Um, while Corey was cooking, I did throw some resources up into the chat. Um, so you could see that there's a couple links up there to find local food for our CSAs, the farm stands. Um, also Vermont Land Trust is doing a great job at um, compiling a bunch of different resources for people to locate local food at this moment. Um, and, you know, as Corey kind of uh, gets ready to cook up this fish, I do just want to take a moment and recognize um, how unprecedented this is and just give a big thanks, not only from the Vermont Farm to Plate Network, but also from Vermont Fish and Wildlife and everybody involved. Um, for all those who are on the front line and who are going in to make sure that not only we could stay fed, but that we could stay healthy. So um, seriously, thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. and. Um, it really has um, it really has shown me personally just how resilient Vermont is and how much we pick each other up. Um, so as Corey gets ready over here, um, over here on the potatoes, as you can see, they're they're frying up nicely. Um, as they uh, get going, one of the things that I always like to add and make sure um, is some fresh herbs if you have them. So I know it's a little bit early in the season to be having those outside, um, obviously, because it just snowed. So goes Vermont in April, right? Um, so if all you have are these Italian seasoning things in your cabinet, that's good to go as well. So I just like to sprinkle those on. Um, and another way that you can make sure that you have fresh herbs through the rest of this is you can grow some in your windowsill. Um, they're pretty easy if you get a nice sunny spot. Just put some seeds. You can even um, use like old yogurt containers and um, 
end up growing some pretty nice herbs that you can use and use all year long. Uh, While you're getting ready, we have a we have a question about what kinds of fish should be yeah. deboned or not when you're cooking them. Yeah, it depends on what type. And I know you can't see my head right now, but it is it is what it is uh, for what we're doing. Uh, but typically with with trout, you're going to clean any scaly fish. You're going to want to flag. Uh, so that's going to be fish like perch, your bass, uh, pike. Uh, you're going to want to flame pike's a whole other challenge because it's got those extra Y bones in there. Uh, but for fish like what we're doing right now, we're just taking the, cooking these in a skillet. Uh, trout are really nice because you just can clean them and cook them whole with a skin on. Uh, so for those of you that weren't didn't see what I was doing earlier, all I did. Uh, was I threw about half a stick of butter in, in the skillet and put it on about medium heat. Uh, medium to medium to high basically is where I want it. And I'm only going to do about three minutes per side. So we get back to where you can see me. So I throw the fish in. It's going to be about three to four minutes each side. I'm just garlic salt, onion salt it, and that's it. That's all I'm doing. And you know, when it's done, the, it actually starts to crisp up a little bit, kind of like a potato chip. And it, it tastes delicious, the, the skin on it, when it gets like that. It gets really, really good. Uh, so what we'll do, we'll throw them in. Those of you that did see earlier, again, this is what it looks like when it's all cleaned out. So all I did was just run some water over on it, and it just cleans out everything nicely for you. Uh, but I'll just set that right in there. Throw our second one in. And then garlic salt and onion salt is all of there is. So just a little onion salt, garlic salt, and now we just give it a few minutes to cook. Uh, and it's re really as simple as that. Uh, with some of our largest, it'll be smaller brook trout, like the six to eight inch length are perfect for the skillet. When you get into those larger sized fish, then you're going to want to be doing, uh, you might be putting it in the oven. Uh, so if I'm just cooking up like a large, uh, it's like I've got a five pound browns in my freezer from over ice fishing season. And when I finally get around to cooking that one, that's going to be an oven fish. And with that, I would, I would clean it just like I just did, but I cook the whole thing in the oven and I'd stop it with mushrooms and scallions with a thing of butter up in, in the inside and that would all kind of saute up in there. When do other fishing seasons end up opening um, that people can go out looking if they're not looking to fish for trout? So again, whenever you're gonna go out fishing, you have to check the regulations per the body of water you're fishing. Cause I might be, let's say I'm fishing on bombazine, the regulations for bombazine could be different from a body of water down the road. Uh, because we regulate based on what's in the, that body of water. Uh, and you don't have the same fish species across the entire state. You don't have the same aquatic ecology that's happening there. Uh, so the best way to answer that question is just check the regulations. You can check them online or in the law digest. And hold on, I have to flip this. Uh, I can smell it. It smells so good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And everyone kind of see that it's smoking up nicely, uh, but you can see where it crisped up just the way I wanted it to. And now we just do the other side. It doesn't. It doesn't take long. Uh, but in season right now, kind of getting back to the other question. Uh, I mean, you got trout. You start fishing for tomorrow. Uh, but right now, uh, bullheads are really popular. Uh, if you haven't been bullhead fishing on our website, we, or our Facebook page, we just posted a bullhead fishing video. Uh, that's a great way to get out this time of year and actually do some fishing. Hey, Corey, we have a question. Does anybody ever use lemon slices inside the fish? Yes. Yeah, so uh, lemon slices, I mean, there's, this is just like the base, most basic way to show you how to do it. Um, yeah, lemon's very common. The lemon slice is actually on top of it. Uh, maybe wrap it in tin, wrap the whole fish in tin foil, cook it on the grill. Uh, I like to stuff it with sliced mushrooms a lot of times. So I'll put in like scallions, mushrooms, onions, stuff that all in there and cook it while it's doing this. And it kind of cooks up together. Uh, so one other thing I wanted to mention as well. Uh, so we have, because obviously we're focused on trout processing right now. 
In Vermont, we have four species of trout. You have your lake trout, brown, rainbow, and brook trout. The brook trout, which we're cooking now, is the only native stream-dwelling trout that we have. So what that means is, well, lake trout are native too, but those are, those are in the lake. Brown trout were introduced from Germany. Uh, I mean, this was several hundred years ago. Uh, so now we have them, we stock for them, but it's not necessarily a native species to Vermont. And the same thing with rainbows. Rainbows came out from out west, and now we stock them as well. Brookies, though, which is what we're cooking, those have been here the whole time. Hey, Corey, are the fish open or closed in the skillet? Closed. So basically, I just threw the whole, I just, all I did was take out the guts, cut the head off, and throw the whole fish in. Skin on everything. Awesome. Um, and how long How long does that take usually? Usually a couple minutes per side, and right now it's looking like I'm just about there. So, um, folks, as you can see, uh, trout, I know someone said trout's kind of like a mystery um, to them, and it was to me too, um, but the folks at Fish and Wildlife do such a good job at explaining it. I mean, it really is not that hard. I actually cut my, my first trout last year, um, and I cleaned it and ate it that afternoon for lunch, and um, it was awesome. I also, my my family's just blowing up the comments with how cute I look. I guess I'm doing well here in Vermont. Um, <laughs> um, so as you can see, we still have the we still have the potatoes going. Um, and if they start getting crispy and you want to finish them off, another good way to do that is to just throw some water in the pan and put a lid on top and steam them till you're done until they're nice and tender. Um, I also saw that um, someone from the Vermont Foragers uh, Facebook group uh, popped in, and one um, they were saying that the wel the community on there is super welcoming. And as someone who really started looking into wild foods and finding them on the ground that we walk around um, last year, I can attest that the Vermont Foragers page has been uh, one of the best resources. And the community there is great. You can ask questions. Um, you can celebrate your finds, um, and everybody's super willing to help you out. So if you're at all interested, I would definitely check there because they can provide you with some great resources and for everybody to uh, really dive in and start finding all the fun wild foods that are around. Um, so the last thing that we wanted to pair with this, so we have these awesome skillet potatoes that are coming farm fresh from all our great farmers. Um, we have some wild ramps thrown in there. We have um, a side with some sprouts and some maple balsamic. We have the nice fresh trout that was caught and processed and skilleted. Um, and of course you gotta have dessert, right? Um, so for dessert, one of the easiest and most delicious things that I have found to cook is a slow cooker apple pit. And I know you're thinking, but it's April, where are all the apples? Um, the best part about this is that the apples generally are available almost year round. Our orchards throughout the state do such a good job at making sure that they're available for folks to enjoy. Um, these apples come from Champlain Valley Orchard, so big shout out to them and thank you. Um, and um, any orchard really around the state, you should check in and see if they have stuff available if you're craving it. So. For the slow cooker uh, apple crisp, um, the best, the, my favorite thing about it is that you can put it in in the morning, put it on, go to work and come back and you have a delicious dessert that you don't have to worry about. So the first thing that you're gonna wanna do is make your top, right? So you get some rolled oats, um, whatever amount you hunt. I'll be able to provide a recipe for you um, um, in the comments here. I mean, I'm, once you start cooking your apple crisp, you're gonna get used to just kind of eyeballing it. So we put the rolled oats in there. The next thing that you wanna add is you wanna add probably like about a cup of flour, maybe a little bit more. We got some King Arthur flour, which is a Norwich employee owned, another great Vermont company that's stepping up and making sure that our communities are being fed. Um, so throw that in. Um, it calls for brown sugar, but I don't have any brown sugar in the house. So instead we are using these organic maple sugar um, and we're gonna mix a little bit of maple syrup in it to kind of get that same effect. Um, again, there are certainly a recipe for this, but I encourage you all to do this to your heart's content. 
Um, so sprinkle a little bit of sugar in there. We have our maple syrup, which I sprinkle a little bit in there. And then you want to add your seasoning. So I think some cinnamon sounds good. Um, you can add nutmeg. You can add ginger, which is one of my favorite things. Um, and then in that, while Corey was cooking that fish, I put some butter onto the stove top. Um, so that was all melted down. And basically what you're going to do is you want to take all your dry ingredients, mix them all up, and then dump that butter straight into it um, and start mixing that up until you get a nice crumb, which um, is going to be delicious and cooked on, on top of your apple crisp in the slow cooker. Now I know you're thinking, well, why would I do a crumb? Isn't the point for it to be crispy? And don't worry, I got a technique for you that will blow your mind. At least it blew my mind once I started figuring that out. Um, so after that, you're gonna take your Vermont apples. Um, again, apples are a great way to engage your kids on this or engage some younger folks who may not be used to cooking um, or haven't done it before. They say to peel the apples, but I also don't always have time to peel the apples, nor do I really care that much. So you just kind of do a rough chop, get the centers out of there. Um, make sure you save all your food for your compost bin, or um, if you're like us, we have like a worm bin in the kitchen that ends up eating all our scraps, and then we can throw them right onto uh, the garden in the end. Um, so with a rough chop with that, um, you could do it as big or as small as you want. And um, again, uh, I think the, the best part about this is that you can make sure that this is a dessert that you can have year round. Um, so as you get your apples cut, um, you're gonna throw them into your pot. Um, obviously this is a demo because I've been cooking an apple crisp uh, since we uh, started this morning. Um, so with that pot of apple crisp, what's gonna go into this is again, just about two tablespoons of, of flour to make it nice and gooey in there. So sprinkle a little flour in and then throw in your seasonings like your cinnamon and your nutmeg. Um, and your ground ginger is one of my favorite ones. Oh, let me make sure I got all of it in there. Um, and then take some nice lemon juice and just give it a nice squeeze and that's going to bring it all together for you um as you can tell um, i'm really trying to channel my like inner ann burrell and all of those food network stars that i spent <laughs> watching when i was a kid so um once you mix that all up um you're going to take that um fill up your crock pot with it and then you're going to pile the apple crisp right on top of, you're gonna pile the crisp right on top of those apples. So what you're gonna do with this is you're gonna plug this in once it's ready. Um, and it can sit on low for about uh, two and a half to three hours and it should be ready. But I've also put it on for about eight hours before and it was just as delicious. Now, like I said, the key to keeping a crisp apple on top is this handy paper towel. So if you put a paper towel right up top and put it underneath the lid, what that's gonna do is that's gonna soak up all of the moisture that's coming from the apples and make sure that your crisp can stay nice. So um, once that's all done, what you'll have is a beautiful oops, finished apple crisp. Um, so, with that, I also think um, I want to mention too that uh, you don't have to necessarily use uh, apples that you buy from the store or you buy from the farm stand because um, as you all know, probably wandering around the woods in beautiful Vermont, you're going to run across an apple orchard. And one of those um, apple orchards when I was living in the Northeast Kingdom, you couldn't barely eat the apples when they were raw. But my God, when you cut them up, covered them in maple sugar and maple syrup, and then cook them for two to three hours. Uh, they were absolutely delicious. Um, so with that, Corey, is there anything else that we should know about the fish? Yeah, so I had to run over and turn on my hood bend a second ago because it was getting smoky in there. That's why we cut over to Shane. Uh, 
But the fish is done. So basically, right as soon as we cut off, I took the fish off. So for these that didn't get to see it, you see how it crisped up nicely. You see on this top one, I was already just picking at it a little bit. And the meat is actually, it flakes right off. And the skin is quite literally, it's, it's crispy. So it's like a potato chip. And I mean, I'll, I'll take a bite just to show you that it's, it's, it's edible. And it's, it's delicious. Uh, so really, I mean, all that was is garlic salt, onion salt, butter. And that's all I did. If you want to get more complex, a lot of different ways that you can do it. Uh, that really, it only takes a few minutes to, to uh, kick cut them up. I mean, if you're going to flam, so like bast or perch, for example, uh, it's a whole other technique you would have to do because of the scales on the fish. But with trout, since you can eat it with the skin on, all you have to do is just cut it, take out the guts, and you're good to go. Uh, so for those of you looking to get out and go trout fishing tomorrow, uh, we hope you enjoy it. It looks like it should be a nice weekend for it. I plan on getting out there first thing in the morning. Uh, but if you do want to stay up to date on techniques and where people are actually catching fish in the department or in the state, uh, we encourage you to uh, get on and go onto our website and subscribe to the week uh, the bi-weekly fishing report the department puts out. It gives you tips on fishing locations, what type of lures are working, anglers from all over the state. Uh, chime in about that. And you can get to that by going onto our department website, looking under the fish tab and just click it, clicking on Vermont Fishing Reports. And one was just published today, uh, right at the beginning of trout season. Awesome. Uh, Corey, we have a one question. Are there any variations in the recipe for pickerel? Yes. Uh, so pickerel, pickerel, pike, those type of species, uh, they have uh, the wide bones on them. Uh, so I would have to flay that out, and you'd have to be careful of the Y bones. So typically when I'm cutting those up, you're going to, instead of getting like uh, two flays, so like one per side on a normal fish, uh, with those fish, you'd be cutting them up, and you, you'd end with five flays because you're cutting around those bones. Uh, so with pickerel, you can't cut them open like you would a trout uh, because of the way those scales are. So you'd have to flay them out. Awesome. Well, um, I think on that note, uh, we just want to thank everybody for tuning in to this to this trial run. Um, it was fun to have you all here and to cook some stuff. It was nice to be able to knock my dinner out of the way as well. So um, again, um, a big thank you to everybody who um, is working hard to make sure that uh, we're picking up our community here. Uh, we can't say thank you enough. And also to everybody who's staying home and making sure that uh, we can uh, get through this together. Um, as Corey said, uh, check out the um, the fish the fish tab on Vermont Fish and Wildlife that was posted in the comments. Um, also, I posted a, a bunch of resources for place to go find local food. And um, I think if there's anything we want to leave you with, it's that wild foods and um, our Vermont grown food they go together so well. So as you're out there and you're um, having fun, enjoying nature, also think about um, how everything pairs together because you know we're all in this together. So, Corey, do you have anything else you wanted to add? Hopefully you can get out there and enjoy some fishing this weekend. Uh, remember though, that if you do go out fishing, uh, stay with it, uh, stay away from, basically stay away from people is the general theme of things. Uh, but if you're trying to measure out that six foot distance, uh, a fishing pole is typically six feet. So if you can touch them with your fishing pole, you're too close. That's all I have, hope you get out, do some fishing. Have a good weekend. Thanks, everybody. We'll maybe see you again. I don't know. <laughs>